So the last part of this video is going to have to do with modifications that plants can have. Now, not all plants are obviously going to have this, but these modifications are going to be things that most likely these plants evolved as a result of the environment that they were growing into. So they were trying to adapt to live in that crazy environment. So the first type um, of modifications we're going to talk about are going to be root modifications. Um, so there's a lot of things that you might need modifications for. Maybe you have poor nutrients, maybe you're in a very highly eroded area, but what we're going to get into now is going to be different things that plants can adapt to have in order to make them grow in a tough environment. <clears throat> so the first type are going to be these ones called prop roots. And just like it sounds, these roots are there to prop up the plant. So this is actually going to be corn growing and you can see these prop roots growing out from it and those are going to help the plant kind of prop up if it was going to get blown by the wind. So that's going to be um, the point of those. The next type are going to be what are called aerial roots. And just like it sounds, aerial roots are going to grow up into the air. So here's one picture of crazy aerial roots um, and a strangler fig right here growing up. But a better example would be on an orchid. So you can see on this orchid all of these roots kind of growing out here and that's because orchids tend to grow in an environment where it's really humid and so they can just pull the water that the plant needs from the air. So those are going to be aerial roots. <clears throat> the next type is going to be what are these things are that are sticking up and that's called pneumatophores. So pneumo usually has to do with lungs, right? And these act like the lungs of the plant. So um, these that you see over here are actually from the trees that you see in the background which is kind of crazy. And um, the reason these are growing is because these are probably growing in a very anoxic swamp, which means no oxygen. And so these will come out and grow above the water so that they can actually get oxygen for the plant in order to, for it to survive. So that's going to be what pneumatophores look like. Um, the next type that we're going to talk about are going to be contractile roots. And contractile roots are an adaptation that a plant might have due to living in an area where there's a lot of erosion. <clears throat> and so you can see these here and what's going to happen is those are going to grow and kind of corkscrew into the ground to really root that plant in the ground so that even if some erosion happens, it's so stuck in there that it's not going to go anywhere. So lilies are going to be a great example of a plant that does that. <clears throat> then the next type of root, this is a lovely one, um, is going to be called a parasitic root. And a parasitic root, just like it sounds, is going to grow into other plants and suck out all their nutrients. Lovely, right? And so um, what you're seeing in this picture, this is actually a vine called the love vine. And it's called that because it loves you so much that it kills you. And the real name of it is daughter. And so um, all this yellow is going to be the parasitic roots that are growing into these plants and actually killing them because it's sucking out all their nutrients. <clears throat> Another example of that is going to be um, mistletoe. Mistletoe. All right, um, the next type is going to be what are called um, food storage roots, and a radish is a great example of that. So as you can imagine, that's going to be an adaptation to a plant that's growing in an area where there's not a lot of nutrients, and so it's going to hold on to those and store those until it's time to flower, and then it's going to use all those nutrients it's stored to put into the flower. So if you're ever growing a vegetable like this that you want to eat, you want to make sure that you harvest it before it starts to go to flower, because once it starts making those flowers, this is going to get smaller and smaller. I am speaking from personal experience because I totally screwed that up last year. <clears throat> and then the last type is going to be what are called water storage roots. Um, water storage roots, sorry, second to last. Um, water storage roots are obviously going to be an adaptation for a plant that grows in an area where it's kind of dry. Pumpkins do this. And it's really cool because they send out these roots and then they're going to hold on to water so that when it gets too dry and the plant is going to die without any water, it can use that reserve. And when you pull them out of the ground, if you're lucky enough to get them out intact, they look like a bunch of clear grapes um, that are just full of water. <clears throat> okay, and then the last type is going to be what are called buttress roots. And here's a picture of um, a buttress root that I took in Costa Rica when I had some students down there. And so this guy right here in the middle was like 6'4", to give you an idea of how big these buttress roots are. And so it's going to be all this stuff that's coming down right here. And obviously that is a huge tree that's growing. And once again, it's to prop it up in case if there's some type of like windstorm or something like that. So all of those are going to be adaptations that a plant can have in their roots in order to deal with things in the environment. <clears throat> now, the next type of modification we're going to talk about it can occur in the stem. 
And it's kind of interesting because some people don't realize that the things that they're eating are modified stems sometimes. So the first type we're going to talk about is going to be a bulb. And um, if you garden, you're probably familiar with bulbs because we plant them in the fall and that's what tulips and things like that come from. But um, <clears throat> an edible one is going to be an onion. And so the stem is actually going to be this kind of knobby thing right here and then it has these big fleshy leaves around it. But the whole thing is called a bulb and that is technically a modified stem. Very similar to that is going to be this, that's called a corm. And a corm is going to do the same thing, it just doesn't have those fleshy leaves. Um, and those are going to be like um, crocuses, you know, those little guys that are the first flowers that come up in the spring? That would be an example of that. <clears throat> um, let me make sure we're going along with the same one. Okay. Um, next one is going to be rhizomes. And rhizomes are going to be a um, horizontal underground stem connecting to plants. So like the fern has these, right? And I should tell you as a little rule of thumb, if a word when we're talking about plants begins with R-H-I, or R-H-Y, that means it's talking about something that either has roots connected to it or is a root or is something to do with roots. So very important in case you're freaking out on an exam and you see R-H-I and only one of the answers has to do with roots, I'd probably go with that. All right, and then the next one, runners and stolons. This is a strawberry plant right here. And that's very similar to the previous one, except it's over the ground and it's going to be a horizontal stem connecting the plants. All right, and then we have tubers, which are going to be like your potato. And so um, if you look, the roots are actually growing off of the potato. So a lot of people think the potato is a modified root, but only sweet potatoes are. Regular potatoes are going to be a modified stem called a tuber. And then um, the last type of modif modification in stems is going to be these little guys called tendrils. And tendrils are going to be what a plant can use to kind of climb up, so like ivy uses them. This is a picture of sweet peas. And what they do is they actually use that to get higher and higher so that they can get maximum sun exposure. Or sometimes they can use them to strangle off other plants, like morning glories kind of strangle off other plants pretty well with those. So those are all going to be examples of modified stems. And the last section, we're going to get into modifications of leaves. And before we talk about modifications, let's talk about the different forms they can have, which you should be familiar with at this point. So um, leaves can either be what are called simple or compound. If they're simple, they're all going to be one part, like you can see here, right? You don't see any little pieces coming off. Even though it has those lobes, it's still all one piece. Different from a compound leaf. So this is all one leaf, but you can see it's divided into what are called little leaflets. And the way that you know this is a leaf is because here's the branch right here, and then the leaf is coming off of the branch. Now, compound leaves can have two arrangements. They can either be what's called pinnately compound, which is like what you see here where you have two leaves coming off per node, or they can be palmately compound, which is where you have them all radiating out from one common axis. The way I think of it is like your fingers radiating out from your palm, right? So that's how I remember palmate leaf. Now, another way that they can have modifications um, is in how the leaves actually come off of the branch itself. So the leaves can alternate, which is where you have one off the right, one off the left. So you're really only having one leaf per node. You can have what's called opposite, where you um, have two leaves coming off per node. And then you can have world, which is where you have a bunch of leaves coming off per node. So that's going to be the way that the leaves can actually come off of the branch. All right. Now, what we're going to get into at the end is going to be different types of modifications that leaves can have to deal with living in different environments. And the first type are going to be what are called floral leaves. So floral leaves are going to be the result of a really crappy flower, basically. So right in here is where the actual flower is on a poinsettia, but it's not very attractive and pollinators don't really get attracted to it. But what the plant has done is grown these leaves that are the color that is going to attract the pollinator, and then the pollinator might come and accidentally pollinate the plant. So um, floral leaves are just designed to look like a flower, <clears throat> and they do. The next type are going to be spines, so like on a cactus, and they're going to have a couple of different functions. The main function is to prevent water loss. And so um, they don't have a lot of surface area, so they're not going to be flat and like exposing all of that to the sun and losing all of that to the sun. 
And then the other thing is for predator, um, you know, to keep predators away, because obviously if a predator bites into that, it is not coming back for more. The next type are going to be what are called reproductive leaves. And reproductive leaves are going to be a cluster of leaves where you could actually crack them off, put them in water, and they will turn into a whole new plant. So here's some examples of it on this plant, but something you're probably more familiar with is what's called a spider plant. And you can see all these clusters of leaves down here. Each of those, if you broke those off and put them into soil or water, would turn into a whole new plant like what you see here. Now this next one is super cool, I think. Um, window leaves. And this is gonna be for plants that grow in very, very dry environments. And so if you look at the top, the tops are brown, so that obviously isn't photosynthetic. And then you can see the majority of the leaf is clear, and then the bottom is going to be um, green, photosynthetic. So what happens is these will bury themselves up until where the green starts, so that no green is actually above the ground where it's going to lose a lot of water to the environment. But since they're clear, it allows sunshine to penetrate below the soil, so they can actually photosynthesize underground. I think that's super cool. Um, and then we have our insectivorous leaves, right? So like the Venus flytrap. And um, a lot of people don't think about why a plant would um, start to do something like that. But if you think about these insects that it's eating, they're very, very rich in nitrogen. And what they found is a lot of these plants that live in environments that are very deficient in nitrogen, they tend to have more insectivorous plants. And so it's a way for them to get their nitrogen because they're not getting it from the soil. So I have a couple of videos I'll show you real quick. Um, oh, I think I have to go into this mode to show you. Yeah, um, of a Venus flytrap. And we're gonna talk about this a little bit more in chapter 39. But um, what you're gonna see is that there's little triggers inside the plant and it's based on water pressure. And what's gonna happen is eventually that water pressure is going to move and it's going to cause that Venus flytrap to close. Now, it's not a very fast process. People often think that it's you know super fast. Um, sometimes it can be, but most of the time it's going to be a pretty, um, a little bit of a slower process than you would think. I don't know what is going on with this, but huh, everything's kind of freezing. Um, so there's a couple of different types. So actually, if it looks like this is going to freeze. My computer is almost dead. Um, I'll stop recording, but you can go through the PowerPoint and you can actually look at it um, for you.